Okay, uh, welcome to lecture five of the introduction to ge geographic information systems. Today we'll see if I can talk. Uh, so last time we really kind of finished off the the bare bones introduction to what a GIS consists of. And so now we're going to find ourselves moving into more of, uh, of the data area. So what we actually would feed into a GIS. Um, today we're going to talk about census data. Um, if you have finished last lecture and you're on to this one, you've probably heard my slight soapbox uh, from the last lecture where I basically explained that I don't want people to just pass over specific types of data sets because uh, they feel that their area doesn't actually require um, this type of information and so it does, it's not important for them to know. When we're doing a GIS, it's important for us to know all types of data that we can use within this um, really within within these systems. Uh, so today, uh, like I said, we're going to get started on census data. It should be hopefully a little bit short, um, you know, a little bit under the 30 minute mark. I have attached a link inside of this, but as you're getting this in the video, I will put the link in the uh, in the description down below. Uh, it is a conference. Well, I'll get to it in a little bit, but because I'm so excited about how amazing this video it is and how important it, I, how much I love to watch it. Uh, I'll just like give a little bit of a spoiler. It's on Zootopia, if you've seen it. It's a movie from Disney and it's a great kids movie. I saw it, oh, probably three years ago now when it came out. And, you know, for being a kids movie, it's, it's something that adults can definitely go see. And when you see the relationship to GIS with in the movie, it just becomes even better for me. But I digress. I'll get into it a little bit more when we finally talk about it a little bit as an example. But um, like I said, let's talk about census data. So the two main things that happen when you're dealing with census data is that it's kind of broken down into these two main ideas of like a relationship or the units that break up, make up the relationship. So first you have your street segment, which is the range of addresses that can run along a street from one intersection to the next. And so it runs on a node system. So like what we think about um, when we were talking about vector topological structure, uh, these types of census data run on the same idea that there is a line segment, which is your essentially block. And then when there is a, um, an intersection of a road, that is where the node meets, right? It's two separate street segments that meet and make form a node. And so for what we would think of as just an intersection of, you know, first and main, for this is its uh, segment line one to segment line three and five or something like that. It, it all depends on whatever the line sections are named. Uh, and then the other is the address range. And so this is more of the numerical range of the lowest possible house number at one intersection and the highest possible at the other. And so it kind of accounts for the actual total addresses on that line segment. So that's how census data is essentially organized in terms of its uh, topological relationship. When we think about actual values, because census data is an extremely complex. I mean, you the demographic situation that's within the census data, the median income, I mean, really just all of the information that's held within a census is just absolutely mind-blowing. And I hope to kind of explain that with a lot of examples. We're going to hit a lot of examples at the end of this lecture today because I'm, I'm, I want to impress like just how much information is held within the census and how useful it can be uh, for different examples. And so I don't believe I have any archaeological examples, but maybe if I can think of some along the way, I'll try to throw them in. But um, you have census units, which are essentially a way of explaining how you would break down the information that's contained within the survey. And that census tracts, which is your largest group, it covers a uh, total population um, I'll get into it a little bit. And then you have block groups, blocks, and then blocks. So you can kind of see how it descends in the pyramid. So census tracts are defined by the U.S. Census Bureau for statistical reporting of demographics, economic, and other data. Really just a way of defining large units within the stats. Uh, the boundaries follow major streets or natural features, right? So it's not just an arbitrary boundary that cuts across somebody's pro property. It has to follow some sort of feature. And the population in each track is approximately 4,000 uh, regardless of its size. So if it's a little bit older, a little bit uh, under, it, it, it's all related to how close you can get it while still following some sort of boundary that makes sense. And then census tracts are numbered consecutively, uh, unique within the jurisdiction. So it's really what, you know, they're all unique numbers. And then um, 
you would never have some on a census tract that's labeled differently. Uh, hopefully I can kind of get into it a little bit. So if you're looking at Buffalo, the census tracts look something like this. So there's 4,000 or yeah, 4,000 people within that in the inner city. They're smaller as you get out towards uh, like towards Lake Ontario, you end up having larger tracts that they all follow essentially the same rules of being 4,000, but their size is completely different. So when you get to that second level, uh, you end up with block groups, which are essentially a population of 1,500. And then you have boundaries that are within the census tract boundaries, basically. So you're never going to have a block group that's outside of a, uh, the boundary of the original census tract. And the reason, my understanding for the reason of having uh, a population of 1,500 and not something a little bit smaller or a little bit larger to kind of encapsulate the total 4,000 within the census tract is that you don't actually want an even value to go down in this pyramid. You want a little bit of overlap on either side. So you don't actually have uh, a total third and you don't actually have just under half or a quarter or something like that. You don't want something that easily fits within uh, the group because if you have that, you're ending up having to just basically reduce that value of whatever the statistics you're looking at and there's going to be no change. And so it's a way of having some redundancy built into the um, into the measurements so that your reduction in sample size for a statistical method isn't going to just be the same values that you would get with a census tract. So you're making all of these block groups, censuses or census tracts, uh, census tracts, block groups, and uh, blocks. They all have their own unique value in what you would kind of consider for when you're using a statistical method. So if you're looking at median income, census tract may not be as useful as, you know, say blocks, depending on where you are. So, um, oh, yeah. So block groups, uh, same idea. This is kind of the same idea. I pulled this from a student in my own department. Uh, where he did this for a project because I, as like I said, as an archaeologist, I am not a uh, person that tends to focus specifically on census tract, and so I've only ever done small stuff that really has, doesn't have a great visibility. But this is uh, the total of Erie County, and uh, you can really see here that there <laughs> there's a very large number of block groups within uh, Erie County itself, and that the, and when you have large um, population centers, those block groups get smaller. And it makes sense, right? Denser areas, denser population, smaller block groups. So to the finest, smallest group is uh, the smallest geographic area is formed by street segments. I mean, it's really, you know, if you have a connection of four streets that go around, you have a block, right? And they're coded by a four digit number. The first one represents uh, the block group. So it represents each value, each block group is given a value. And that first number or that first digit within this code is the block group. And the last three are consecutive unique that are valued. So it's essentially the unique identifier within that block group. Okay, so let's get like a, you know, hypothetical map going out here. So you basically have a county that has a number of census tracts in it. And as you get into the census tract, you can then reduce that down to a block group. And then once you have the block group, you can further reduce that down into a local block that has the total coverage. Uh, I know that this map doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but the best thing to do is to know that the top photo is essentially your census tract that has then been reduced and blown out so you can actually see the total number of, sense, uh, of blocks within the census tract and then the uh, block groups within the census tract, excuse me, and then however many uh, blocks you can see within the block group. Okay, so we've kind of talked about how everything's been organized, all of the different ways of understanding census. Now let's kind of do the slight history lesson here. So the first digital format really for the census was the dual independent map encoding system or the DIME system. And it was a data format that was used by the U.S. Census Bureau to encode street networks and um, the related data with, that's contained within the census uh, for the 1980 version and it really only covered the metropolitan areas if you didn't have a large area or a large population density it really wasn't worth doing it because it was still kind of a new thing and a bit of a hassle it's then later replaced by tiger data which is still something that we kind of use today uh, in some way shape or form it's a much better because well I'll get into it but basically what happened is that dime uh, required two file sets it required both the dime system and the dime files which contained all of that information that 
comes out of answering the census. And then the, it required the GBF files or the geographic base files, which uh, were the geographic reference system within uh, the DIME overall dime system uh, and then it's replaced by tiger to incorporate all of this information into a single objective uh, file structure so let's kind of get in and explain why dime didn't work so you have um, to non-topological and topological structures right and that's really understanding the value of the relationship or really caring about the value of relationships within um, features, right? So with a non-topological structure, as we talked about a few lectures ago, uh, you essentially take polygons and you have the coordinates of those polygons and they are not related. So if you're drawing A and B, every node in line segment or every node for that matter is, is recorded. And the, if there is more than, if there is a line segment or a set of nodes that are used for more than one polygon, it's going to be recorded twice because it's not recording the value. And so it is um, uh, basically a way of making sure that you don't, it's not as complex and you don't have to worry about as many errors. When you're dealing with topological structuring, you're dealing with the understanding that polygons are related to, are, can be related. And so that they, the nodes in the line segments can have uh, the same values within multiple polygons. And so it's a way of understanding the relationships and knowing where everything is organized and that was the real problem here with the uh, the dime files is that they were non-topological and they really had a limitation because of that it required more space uh, it was also very difficult to understand what you were organizing and how you were organizing so one side of the street essentially wasn't the same value as the other side of the street if it was improperly organized so right so we need to go into this non-topological or this topological map again uh just to explain what i mean here uh you can have multiple line segments and if you use the line segments as the basis for structure you're able to record nodes and have an understanding of the relationships within polygons and so block groups you understand that block groups contain a number of blocks and they all are related and that one side of the street is not different from the other side of the street. You're encountering everybody that lives within two sets of nodes. Okay, so let's get into Tiger. Tiger is uh, the topologically integrated geographic encoding and reference files. Don't you love our government? It just blows me away. We have a great filing system called the Tiger, and what it really stands for is essentially saying, yeah, we made a mistake with the dime files, and so we're going to call this one Tiger to explain that, yes, it actually does integrate topological referencing. Uh, and it was developed by the U.S. Census in 1990. Uh, the spatial and attribute processes were combined into one system. We really can't explain it any simpler. simpler. They understood that if you have attributes, you want to know where they are and what the relation is to all of everything around it. And it's one single seamless data set that covers the entire country. So it was no more just like being limited to the metropolitan area. It was in covering the entire the United States. And it was all topologically structured to understand the relationship between census tracts, census block and blocks um, or, cens or census blocks, census tracts, block groups, and blocks, excuse me, you can never get that right, but it's really to understand what's going on here and what the important thing to take away from Tiger data is that it is a total coverage data set that does in fact encode everything uh, within a single object and it is very easily, to, it is very easy to understand the relationships between objects because it is all integrated. So what goes into Tiger files? Um, really when I say it's a single object in what, what does that really mean? So we need to kind of think back to the object oriented programming about essentially understanding that every unique entity that you are trying to map exists as a single object and all of the attributes are then contained within that object. So if you were to call it up into a program, you are essentially assuming that that object has all of the rules and specifications and values associated with it are contained within. And so anything that time you query a question, it's going to already have those attributes involved, uh, which is all of the best part of DIME and then understanding that it needs to be geographically referenced. And so they combined a one to 100,000 digital line graph, which is a map that has been produced by USGS uh, for a number of years now. And it's, so it's a way of geo-referencing this all of this data and it uses a geographic coordinate system which is as we kind of look back to something from earlier that's your longitude and latitude stuff uh, and it had two types of data it's the 
tabular form. So uh, basically Excel spreadsheets where you could just kind of work through it depending on your sampling method of demographic, social, and economic statistics. And then it also had a GIS form in which that you could essentially take these files, put them into a GIS form on the computer, and you could actually see a map, a s small and s very slow map printout. My understanding is, is that this took an unbelievable amount of time to render, but you could put it onto a GIS and be able to select in terms of geography. And aggregated information is was available at block, track, and a few of them are at block level. Uh, I believe now my understanding is is that the majority of the area is available at block level as well. It just took time to process into that uh, level of uh, resolution. The GIS data for Tiger is available in both Polygon and Line. Uh, what that basically is, is that Polygon data contains the population information for tracks, block groups, and blocks, whereas the line data contains the street and utility information. And so it's a way of incorporating two separate data, or two sides of the same data set, but kind of representing them in, in the best ways that they should be exposed. Like if I have a question about utility lines or uh, sewage or however, I whatever question I'm kind of posing, I don't really want to see it in a polygon format. I'm looking to see more of that network analysis. And so I want lines rather than polygons. Uh, whereas if I'm looking at, you know, economic income or uh, median, yeah, median household income, uh, I, I'm going to be more interested in that polygon because I want to see the group rather than the network. And so the data have spatial locations, attributes, and topology. So, you know, it incorporates all of that information that you fill into the census it ha that are now becoming attributes as well as having the geographic information. And it also is a way, has a way of under knowing what is next to it in a way and what those relationships are. Uh, so this is an example again of uh, the tiger data, right? So it has the polygons and where you're able to see all of those really big uh, block or really small, I should say, those really small block groups and a couple of those census tracts in the bottom. And then at the other side, you have uh, all of the streets. And so all of those are coded within the uh, node and line segment. And then the addresses are filled out depending on the connection between those uh, nodes. So uh, there's an ongoing continuation of kind of updating Tiger. Instead of taking a whole blank you thing, there's the whole... Um, as a whole, you have the American Community Survey, which is an ongoing uh, statistical survey that samples a small percentage of the population every year. Uh, you can see it here. It's a way of kind of updating Tiger data sets uh, and also getting down to that block level uh, without having to do it all at once, which would take a mass amount of information. Because we are now doing this in 2020 and the census is currently going on, I would believe that because most of it's done online, or my understanding is that the majority of it is done online, that we, we'll find that Tiger sees a large overhaul within the next four years with all of that information to kind of structure what the 2020 census did. But that's still kind of a ways out. And so really what we're working, working with right now is kind of an updated Tiger data set that sees continuously small updates uh, every year with the American Community Survey. Uh, it's one year estimates for areas with population of at least 65,000 and it's basically a suitable short term stuff for medium to long range large geographic scales and then the five year estimates are all down to block level scale and it's suitable for long, long term changes at small scale. Uh, that's really what the American Community Survey does. Uh, this source is Wikipedia, but I mean, you really can't find this information on census, it's more of one of those things of what you would use it for. And as I am not a professional, this is the best I could find. But, you know, uh, it's a pretty accurate description of how you would use Tiger data. So uh, here you have the stuff in, I believe it's Seattle and Washington. Yep. Uh, you have the census block group in the 1990 census tract. So uh, really kind of both looking at income and seeing the change in this distribution. So they're both in, uh, well, one is in, uh, in the census tract, but it's also very small because it's the metropolitan area. And then you also have the block groups of Seattle in 2000. Over the next few slides, uh, we're going to look at different examples uh, from the coast of Mississippi and Louisiana of areas that are really, we're kind of, horribly affected by Hurricane Katrina. And so 
what I'm going to show here is an example that is using 2000 census data to look at um, questions and areas in specific populations or uh, specific attributes related to the population and how they could be used for disaster relief. So in this first example, we have um, people per square mile. So really kind of showing your densely populated areas within the other region. This slide shows uh, total housing units. So it's basically another way of showing densely populated areas, but instead of considering people, it's considering actual housing units. So now we're moving away from the whole block group and census tracts to looking at like really hard to find areas of populations and basically their way of getting out. So in this map, you see cities that are labeled with 40,000 or more, as well as having all of the boundaries of the county, parish and state boundaries, but also a way of measuring, you know, are there interstates to allow people to get out of the area. In this slide, we are really hammering down on a population that is likely to be in severe danger or, is, or we have to be concerned about and that's your kids right so here you have the population uh, under age 18 and you can see that there is a pretty good spread of kids throughout obviously it's human beings but you know if you were to look at it you'd see right along that coast of louisiana there's a large number of of areas that have people under the age of 18 of uh, a total number of 30 percent or more meaning they make up 30 percent of the population obviously uh, here, let's look more at an economic sense. You have the poverty rate. So this is, again, the census tract looking at poverty rates throughout. I mean, this goes all the way up from 40% or greater and then to less than 10. You can really see areas that are extremely wealthy, also areas that are very, very poor. So pulling out of, um, you know, disaster relief and the examples like that, the early GPSs, actually even now is still into some extent but you're especially with your early early gps and all of your mapping software i don't know if some of you even remember mapquest at this point but uh, mapquest was a, an early way of getting directions off of the internet um i remember my parents doing it when we were going on all of those road trips and you'd take the printout with you uh your early street data on tom toms and your early gps's that were in that are like ha almost handhelds within t cars uh, all of those ran on a tiger as well but the example you see here is actually uh suny buffalo and all of the road systems within suny buffalo and the surrounding area that's all been uh, topologically integrated within the tiger data set so now i can finally talk about one of my most favorite things to talk about when we're thinking about city uh, well tiger data and city information so uh there's a couple of things here. The first one I have to talk about that really is actually the relation of Tiger data and then also the, the great example here is uh, Big Hero 6 is a movie that was produced by Disney. The It's obviously an animated film and um, it's actually based on the geography of San Francisco. And so what they did is they took the geography of San Francisco and the Tiger data set and they used what was called or what is called, I should say, City Engine that is developed by Esri, the same people that make your ArcGIS software, and they created the city in the movie Big Hero 6. Now, they took that example and then expanded on it even further and basically created their own city with its own geography and all of its own unique attributes in the Zootopia. Uh, using the same city engine that's developed by Esri, but they created their own city in a sense, and I absolutely love it. And so the link here you see is actually from the 2017 Esri, excuse me, uh, Esri user conference, in which um, they had a representative from Disney come and give a talk about what they did, both kind of in Big Hero 6, but really focusing down on on Zootopia and how they created all of this amazing stuff. Um, I, 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 like I said, I've put the link in the description of the video here. It's uh, about 18 minutes, which is my hope for kind of ending today kind of short because I really, really want to impress that you should go look at this video. Uh, it really brings home how much GIS can be used in all different aspects of the world and, and in study. Um, Disney is obviously a ve in very close ties with Esri and um, the people out in Redlands, California. And the things that they do within the product of City Engine is just absolutely amazing. Uh, as an art coming from an archaeological standpoint, it really 
well, number one, it makes me feel so inadequate in terms of my technique and my GIS ability when they're creating cities and I'm just simply measuring other areas. But it really makes me question just how much can a few people do as long as they have a proper understanding of the equipment and of the software, how much can they actually do to bring a world to life? And for an archaeologist, that, that really kind of screams at me. I mean, I'm not trying to recreate a city, so to speak, that is my own design, <clears throat> or Heinrich, uh, Heinrich Schliemann or Arthur Evans, you know, not going to point fingers or anything, but it would be kind of amazing to consider doing this for areas that are in danger. If we had a full scan that was able to be pulled out for Palmyra before it was destroyed, or another great example would be Venice. Can we scan and contribute and really study all of the areas within Venice closely before everything sinks underwater and it's completely gone. Can we get a digital creation of that so that it's not gone? And this is one of those things that we can do within City Engine and a GIS and so that we can really hammer down all of those um, dreams of having digital formats of all of these great things before they disappear, before they destroy it. It's like another redundancy within preservation. Um, I'll be off my soapbox here, but I really highly recommend that you go to this link and you look at this video. It's like I said, it's about 18 minutes long, but it, it, it just shows you the amazing things that Disney can do when given uh, at something like City Engine. And I really hope that other fields start to catch on with this idea of major scale 3D modeling and creation within a GIS to create a world. And from that world, we can then take the next step in and start putting people into it and start caring about it. I know I'm kind of off on a soapbox here, but I mean, we have video games that are being created now by a company called Ubisoft that have recreated the landscapes of, of past civilizations and past groups of people. Most, uh, most obviously is the Assassin's Creed Origins, which is taking place in Ptolemaic Egypt and Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which takes place during the ancient Greek. I don't know exactly at what time. I'm a horrible archaeologist. Can you tell? Anyway, uh, you have these examples. And so uh, where they're creating and giving an environment for students and people to play in and, and kind of exist and, you know, explore digitally, it would be great if we could start creating models of the real world and preserve them in a sense so that they can be explored by people. It would be amazing to create full-scale models of archaeological sites that are then imported into engines that create the environment around them and make them preserve for, for life. And one of those things that really comes out of it is that uh, for archaeologists is that we need to understand and realize that this information and this accessibility to the software is, is exists and more often than not it's already on our computer. There are a number of different individuals and number of different fields that have and use GIS software. Almost all of them, the large, large lion's share of, our, of professionals that use a GIS are more than likely on some Esri software, which means that City Engine already exists. And we need to be considering how to use that, uh, in a sense, for our own research to make it more interactable with the general public. We need a way of bringing the general public back into the the world in which science and research exists, rather than being something that's always pent up in the ivory tower and isn't always accessible. All right, I'm done with my soapbox, and so I will move on into you know other things. So. Applications for Tiger Data, right? <laughs> to move completely away and transition away from my soapbox. Um, anyway, you can match addresses. And so basically you have not only the address that's within the attributes of, you know, um, population under 18 or economic information, uh, ethnicity. I mean, it really is all there. And so you have the addresses that are available both in the polygon sense of holding all of that information. And then you also have it available within your streets and nodes or your line segments and your nodes. And so you can essentially map those together. The other thing you can do is network analysis is basically figure out the quickest way or the best way to get to someplace according to the 
uh, line segments and nodes that are within the streets. The other is obviously district delineation, and I have examples for all of these in the next few slides. So address matching, straightforward, right? You have a value in an attribute, you have the name, you can look at all of them, and you have the address. You can take that address and match it into the line segments that are within it. This is an older example. Uh, it's actually very, very easy to do within some of Esri's newer stuff, and I believe we'll do that in one of the labs coming up. Um, another example of basically how it takes is you have the value of the street, 101 and you have the line segment that says okay you can exist within 101 and 119 where is the most likely place and you can basically match it up so network analysis so there's a couple of ways to look at network analysis so you have you know shortest path line which is taking line data and basically figuring out what is the shortest path so in this case it is 283 miles from montpelier to auburn so you know vermont all the way to you know western almost Western Mass, I guess, I, or Western New York. I wouldn't really call Syracuse Western New York, but some would agree, disagree with me. Um, anyway, so the other way you could do this is also the salesperson's problem. So this is the network analysis. And this is the example that I talked about in one of the earlier lectures about UPS or FedEx or Amazon having a real benefit of using a GIS to map their routes. And that's basically knowing, okay, this is where it needs to start and this is where it needs to finish. These are the stops that I have to make. What are the best ways in shortest distance or in shortest amount of time to make all of these stops and get back to where I need to be? And so you essentially map the route of what you would hit first and what, what stop you would hit last according to the shortest, uh, the quickest way. Another is obviously the location allocation, which again is uh, line and polygon data basically so showing, okay, so this is where all of the something comes out of, and then this is where it needs to go to. These are my client areas. This is looking at my the district or the sphere of influence. Where is the best place to put a warehouse to service this area? So you're basically looking at least cost warehouse to retail distribution. Uh, the other thing that we talked about earlier was district delineation. Um, I hate to say it, but census data is explicitly, to my understanding, of how you draw um, political districts. And so you essentially can use GIS to redistrict your information according to the census data. That is how it draws out. So if you need this many people within a district, this is going to show you how many districts you're going to have. Uh, you can see it here. Okay, so we're essentially done for today. Uh, I'm a little bit over time for than I wanted to be. Uh, unfortunately, I got on a little bit of a soapbox there about, you know, the future of archaeology and the history and preservation of the world. But anyway, so we're done. Um, this has been Census Data. It is more or less, it makes a lot of sense for me. I believe that census data is one of the most straightforward and understandable information. And it may have something to do with the fact that it's essentially just demographics of an area and it's all been geographically referenced. And because it's done by the US government, which also works in close alignment with USGS, you can pretty much guarantee that the geographic information referencing system that is within Tiger Data is the best solution to the information. This is one thing that uh, I believe the US government does really well is that they handle their geographic information or their their access to data in, in ways that most countries don't. Um, I probably should have hammered on this a little bit earlier, but uh, the U.S. has decided a long time ago that uh, geographic information uh, and in a lot of ways, de demographics is open information. It's an open door policy and that, you know, if it, it says something about your country or it says something about your area or, you know, you've already paid for something to be done, you should have access to this information. And so I believe it was back in the 1970s, 1980s that the question was posed, actually, maybe even earlier, like as far back as the 1940s, 1930s. Yeah, it could have something to do with that when they were actually selling or giving out full maps. But I digress. Um, essentially, when USGS started mapping whole areas and producing maps, uh, it went before the government to basically be like, okay, should we charge people to have access to this information? And uh, the government essentially left it up to USGS and said, you know, we'll leave it up to you. You decide what to do. And they said, no, uh, that 
anybody sh we should have open access to this information to these maps to this data because we've essentially already paid for it with our tax dollars it's not something we should be doubly charged for and we should be very thankful for that because um, in most places in this world you have to pay for this information or it's just completely not available um, which in some ways it makes learning GIS in the United States uh, both very easy but also uh, very help helpful in the sense that you really understand what you're what you have access to and what you can do when you have the right data set. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Uh, our next example on data sets are going to be GPS. And so we're going to kind of walk away a little bit from, you know, ready-made data sets like Tiger or Dime or Census in general and kind of going into how we produce our own data that can then be, you know, interpreted through a GIS. Uh, so we'll get into the GIS. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at the lab. Um, I would ask for you to have it done by next Wednesday when the second lab goes up. As you don't have an assignment, I'm not expecting anything to be due. Uh, and so I'll leave it at that. Uh, have a good day.